morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Tuesday, February 14th. Here are some of the stories we are covering. Nigeria sees uptake in violence ahead of February 25 elections. More than 134 attacks on INEC facilities and personnel. It's quite disturbing that this is actually happening at this point in time. If this continues, how can we have elections? Nigeria's Electoral Commission says polls will not be conducted in 240 polling units due to security concerns. A Guinean opposition leader calls on all stakeholders in and outside the country to engage in ongoing dialogue. African businesswomen pressed the African Union to address border harassment. Kenyan President William Ruto will deploy the army today Tuesday to curb banditry in one region of the country. We cannot continue to lose lives. Our children cannot continue to be out of school. We cannot continue to lose our security officers at the hands of a few bandits. And another perspective from World Radio Day yesterday, Monday. Those stories plus our Black History Month fact of the day and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Nigeria's National Peace Committee says election-related violence is spiking as the country's February 25 national polls draw near. During weekend campaign rallies, government attacked a security team of a vice presidential candidate, killing three police officers. At another rally, supporters were attacked with machetes, injuring several and damaging campaign vehicles. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria. Idayat Hassan is the spokesperson for the National Peace Committee, a government-sponsored body of former heads of state and officials attempting to promote calm and stability in the country. Speaking to Lagos-based channels television, Hassan raised concerns about the increased attacks at camping events and said Sunday that authorities must prohibit anyone apart from security agents from bringing weapons to camping rallies. The casualties are higher, the numbers of incidences are rising, but there has been more than 134 attacks on INEC facilities and personnel. It's quite disturbing that this is actually happening at this point in time. If this continues, how can we have elections? On Friday, Unidentified gunmen ambushed and killed three members of the security team for Governor Ifanyo Kowa, the vice presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. On Sunday, Okowa visited the families of the slain security officers and condemned the killings. In another incident, one person was killed and five arrested after a violent clash between supporters of the PDP and the ruling All Progressives Congress, APC party during a camping rally in northern Jigawa state. Hours later, many supporters of the Labour Party were attacked and injured by thugs on their way to a rally in Lagos, a stronghold of the APC presidential candidate Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Paul James is a program officer at Yaga Africa, a non-profit that promotes democratic elections. For the election to be concluded in Nigeria, as we know, a candidate or a party has to score a quarter of the vote in, in at least 24 states. Politicians are using violence in different forms as a means for voter suppression. So what we are seeing is the build-up of terror, the build-up of fear, so that um, perhaps impact on citizens' participation. For the politicians, especially the ones that are having the sense that they may not be able to pull the national spread that is required for the elections. Kola Wale Oluwadari, Deputy Director at the Socio-Economic Rights Accountability Project, says authorities have been hesitant to address the problem. The rights group petitioned the International Criminal Court to investigate election-related violence and hold the Nigerian perpetrators accountable. Poverty, rising rate of unemployment can be remote causes, but the impunity as a part of government is a key driver of these incidents, which is why you would see that lack of political will on the part of government to either take action to prevent these attacks on Monday, Nigeria's Electoral Commission said voting will not take place in 240 polling units across 28 states, mainly due to a lack of registered voters in those areas. The voters didn't choose those polling units due to insecurity. 
Imo State had the highest number of canceled polling units, 38. The election comes amid growing frustrations among citizens caused in part by shortages of fuel and the newly designed currency. In Abuja Monday, Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari unveiled new police vehicles, tasers, stun guns and anti-riot equipment, including cannons designed to improve the operational capabilities of the Nigeria police force. Whether this will make voters feel more secure, it is too soon to tell. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. In Nigeria, the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, also known as INEC, says polls will now be conducted in 240 polling units across the West African country due to security concerns. Professor Mahmoud Yakubu also says the polling units do not have registered voters needed by the electoral management body to organize the vote. His remarks follow a meeting with political party representatives ahead of the coming February 25 general elections. For analysis on the latest developments, viewers Peter Clotty reached Jidit Ojo, a columnist for Punch newspaper in Nigeria. The Anna chairman, let me say, is trying to be clever by her. The reason being that the mere fact that the voter did not choose this 240 polling units should never have precluded the commission from sending voters there. However, he was very clear that the 240 polling units would not have voters because of insecurity. If he has left it at that, that, look, because of safety and security of our personnel, of our materials and of the electorate, we will not deploy voters to these 240 polling units. I will understand. But it should never have put the blame on the voter. Do you think this will have any significant impact on the conduct of the election itself? This is quite insignificant. 240 polling units out of the 106,846 polling units is less than 0.001. And we still have 106,606 polling units where um, men and materials as well as voters will be casting their vote. So uh, invariably, I think the commission was just uh, hearing on the side of caution not to deploy, because even as we speak today, the major concern many Nigerians have is uh, those areas where you have high level of insecurity, banditry, you know, mass abductions, Will it be wise to deploy to those places? The answer is no. Jide Ojo is a columnist for Punch newspaper in Nigeria. He spoke with viewers Peter Clotty. A Guinean political leader says it is in the best interest of the country for all stakeholders to be at the table to discuss the future of the nation. This after some prominent opposition leaders, including Selou Dalen Diallo, who came second in the 2020 election, are said to have fled the country following the September 2021 military takeover. The military junta, led by Colonel Mamadi Dumbuya, has bowed to pressure from the Economic Community of West African States to agree to a 24 month transition, although political parties and civil society prefer a shorter timetable. Faya Milimuno, leader of the Liberal Bloc Party, is one of the political leaders who is still in the country. He tells me that everyone, whether in or outside Guinea, should continue to engage in rebuilding the foundations of the nation. So far, we have finished the first rounds of uh, the dialogue. There are some political parties that refused to be around the table. And uh, there are those who are now trying to have uh, another dialogue, not even in Guinea, but uh, outside of the country. And uh, that is not accepted, not only by the other political parties, civil society organizations, but also by the authorities, like the government and the junta. Sidi Ature is out of the country. We hear that uh, Selou Dalin Diallo is also out of the country. What is happening to you, the opposition politicians? Do you think uh, this probably is a deliberate attempt by the military to cancel you, the politicians, thereby no, making no, it no, no, easier no, for no. Colonel Mamadi Dumuya to run for president unopposed? No, that's not the case because uh, first, 
the junta has uh, stated clearly that uh, at the end of uh, this transitional period, no one of them, no member of the government, and no member of uh, the transitional legislative body will run for office. So from my point of view, we don't need to worry about that. And as far as the dialogue is concerned, we are the one who ask for the dialogue. But you name some leaders that are outside of the country, but their political party are in Guinea now. As far as the dialogue is concerned, the dialogue is between political parties, political coalitions, and civil society organizations. Let's say a party like uh, mine, I am actually in North America. If there is any need of dialogue in Guinea, my party is not going to be absent just because I am not there. And even being here, if I want to participate, we are not in the 18th century, no. We are in the 21st century with uh, all the technology. If those leaders want to participate in the debate, no matter where they are, in Japan, in China, in France, Africa, they can directly participate. So, Selu Dalin Diallo came second in the last election to uh, Alpha Conde. Sidi Atoure is a former prime minister. How come <clears throat> these people are out of the country and you are still there? Look, it is not the junta that sent those people outside of the country. As you said, I am there, and you have many other political leaders there. And I don't think they are prevented from living in the country. If somebody say, okay, Dr. Fire is a... Uh, is in America, there is a dialogue. The dialogue has to be suspended or as long as he is uh, outside of the country. The country cannot be run that way. That's why we respect, you know, for everybody to be around the table because we are actually building the foundation of our institutions. It is uh, in the best interest of the country to have everybody on board. And that is exactly what the junta has been doing. Faya Melimuno is the leader of the Liberal Bloc Party of Guinea. You are speaking with us from Toronto, Canada. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I am James Botti, Washington. Today is Tuesday, February 14. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Kenya's President William Ruto has ordered the deployment of the military to the banditry trouble areas of the North Rift Valley. The orders come after deadly attacks and raids on people, schools, and security agencies by the bandits. In a press release on Monday, Kenya's Interior Ministry termed the security situation prevailing in the region a national emergency. Maureen Ojiambo has the story. Tension remains high in Kenya's North Rift Valley region following daily banditry attacks that have since left families displaced. People killed, among them police officers, schools torch, and the closure of social amenities following the unrest. According to Kenya's Interior Ministry, the past six months, bandits and cattle rustlers in the region killed more than 100 civilians and 16 police officers. Speaking on Monday, during a meeting with leaders from the troubled areas, Kenya's President William Ruto said that from today, Tuesday, all the people in the area with illegal firearms must surrender to the police as military operations begin immediately. And we will not leave that area until every illegal gun has been returned, until all children have gone to school, until we have stopped this menace. Because we cannot continue to lose lives. Our children cannot continue to be out of school. We cannot continue to lose our security officers at the hands of a few bandits. In the Kenya Gazette notice on Tuesday, the Interior Ministry gazetted the counties of Trukana, West Pokot, Baringo, Elgeo Marakwet, Laikipia and Samburu as disturbed and dangerous areas. However, former Rift Valley Regional Commissioner, now the Transoya Governor George Natembea, told Kenya Citizen TV that most of the politicians in the disturbed areas are funding the bandits. He was addressing 
culprits, people who financed this thing were sitting in that meeting. But I can tell you, I know many of those guys who are there. They are now worried what's going to happen to their people. What are they going to tell their people when they say that elect me and I'm going to protect you, that your guns will not be taken? What are they going to tell them after three days? Those fellows are worried. Natembea says during his tenure in the region as a commissioner, his efforts to curb bandits and cattle rustlers were frustrated by political leaders. He says that most officers running the operations have also been frustrated and in return some turned out to support the robbers by giving them their guns and bullets in exchange for food. For the three years I was asked Rift Valley. I spoke to His Excellency the President Uhuru Kenyatta more times than I spoke to my peers. So in that kind of circumstances, how do you succeed? You don't have fuel, you don't have vehicles. The officers are completely demoralized. Somebody just woke up one day and said, officers in operation area should not be paid house or any allowance whatsoever. Hardship allowance, nothing. Natembea has revealed that banditry is a business to some politicians who use cut wrestlers to steal cows and sell them in Nairobi. He says most of the bandits are well trained and equipped as some have had military training and understand the tactics used by the police in the operation. Bandits in the region have been given three days to surrender the illegal firearms to the government voluntarily in order to restore peace. In the last three days, seven people, among them four police officers, have been killed and the police vehicles torched by criminals. This is not the first time Kenya has carried out such an operation in the area and it has emerged that insiders sabotage the operations despite the deployment of military in the region. Reporting for VOS Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Giambo in Sacramento, California. Female business owners in Africa say they frequently face sexual harassment and discrimination when they try to cross borders for business. The topic was discussed at a meeting called Gender is My Agenda ahead of this Saturday's African Union Summit in Addis Ababa. Mohamed Yusuf reports from VOA's News Center in Nairobi. African women and girls are discussing the challenges they face trying to conduct cross-border business under the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. The meeting in Addis Ababa is taking place ahead of the African Union Heads of the State Summit, which is set to begin on Saturday and at which the leaders are expected to discuss progress of the African Trade Agreement. Elizabeth Ajok, a South Sudanese national, says women often face problems at border crossing that men don't have to experience. We have seen that uh, in most of the time, the women at the borderline, especially from northern Barkazal where I come from, they are facing a lot of challenges like uh, violence at the border. They are being intimidated and even uh, some of the items sometimes are being confiscated or the goods are being taken because of clearance and they will also overcharge you because you are a woman you will be taxed sometimes they just look at us and they see that you are just a woman so you don't deserve to do uh, business Zaitwa Milanzi says women encounter similar treatment when they cross the border from her native Malawi you find yourself with fees the required fees your papers are in order everything is in order and yet you find some officer at the border asking asking you for sexual, sexual things, and you're thinking, why? It, it really hinders your progress and your ability to trade as a young woman. So this really needs to be addressed if at all young women are to be considered and fully protected under this regime. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement went into effect in May 2019 with the goal of lowering tariffs between African countries and boosting economies. African countries trading among themselves, the World Bank says, could boost Africa's income by $450 billion by 2035. Memory Kachambwa is the head of the African Women's Development and Communication Network. I think when we talk of uh, ACFTA, we we are looking at a pan-African instrument and within the vision of it is to ensure that even the trade that we do is dignified. You know, we talk a lot about uh, women cross-border traders, but are they doing it in a dignified way? Are we really ensuring that they have the service the harassment with the customs union. Are we having those conversations? An organization that promotes women's development in the continent. Even within their own countries, female entrepreneurs in Africa often face funding barriers, gender bias, and a lack of training. Marcy Chukwuma, 
advocates and support women farmers in Nigeria. She says some cultural norms have prevented women from owning land, making them unable to produce food. Lack of training and retraining of women, rural women farmers to enable them stand up in the competitive markets. We talk about land as a factor. You agree with me that the women have limited access to land. We do not have access and control over the land. That's a major factor of production. If we who occupy about 70 percent of agricultural workforce do not have access and control over the land, how then do we produce and produce well? Women own 20 percent of Africa's land but produce more than two-thirds of the continent's food. The pre-summit meeting concludes on Tuesday. Participants hope their leaders will address the challenges of doing business in Africa and ending unfriendly business practices along African borders. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. Yesterday, Monday, was World Radio Day, and many international organizations say radio is still the most immediate form of unbiased breaking news, as evidenced by the recent powerful earthquakes in Turkey. Jill Olmsted is an associate professor of broadcast journalism at American.